The final topic this week devoted to national implementation mechanisms for human rights is universal jurisdiction. We'll talk about, first, the bases of jurisdiction that are widely recognized in international law. We'll then talk about the concept of universal jurisdiction, its scope, its application in treaties and customary international law, and also the rationales in favor of this basis of jurisdiction and some of the risks that it poses. Throughout, I'll draw on examples and illustrations from different cases and different statutes and treaties from around the world. Let's begin with the concept of prescriptive jurisdiction. The idea here is how a state can regulate activities of interest to that state. That could be individuals, it could be corporations, it could be certain kinds of transactions. This is quite common, and international law has a number of rules in this area that determine the scope of the authority that states have to apply their laws to these actors and transactions. So under customary international law, a state can exercise its authority in five distinct ways. First, territory. It should be, at this point, uh, not surprising to you that a state can regulate the activities that go on within its borders. That's one of the fundamental attributes of sovereignty, a concept we studied earlier in the course. It should also be unremarkable that a state can apply its laws to its own citizens or nationals. In addition, it's recognized that a state can apply its laws in situations that occur outside its borders and with respect to non-nationals if the conduct injures its own citizens. This is the, known as the passive personality principle. A fourth basis for jurisdiction is known as the protective principle, again with respect to extraterritorial conduct that nevertheless harms a state's security interests. Now, we're going to focus on the fifth basis of jurisdiction, which is universal jurisdiction. And to do that, to give you some information about universal jurisdiction, I want to turn to a source known as the Princeton Principles on Universal Jurisdiction. The Princeton Principles were drafted by a group of experts to restate the emerging rules of international law with respect to universal jurisdiction. And here you see in Principle 1.1 the basic idea that universal jurisdiction applies in criminal cases due to the nature of the crime, and we'll say more about that in a moment. But what's key about this principle is that it emphasizes the fact that the state that is exercising your universal jurisdiction has no connection to the defendant, to the victim, to the location where the activity occurred, or indeed any other connection. With that in mind, we need to think a little bit more about when a state's courts or prosecutors could extend a state's law in this kind of context, when there is no connection to the forum state or the regulating state. And the Princeton principles provide that this can only apply to serious crimes under international law. Well, what are those serious crimes? Well, Principle 2.1 lists them as including those you see on the slide before you. So this is not just for ordinary crimes, and indeed it's not just for any human rights violation, but rather it is for a very narrow set of enumerated uh, criminal acts. Now that set may be narrow, but it's not necessarily closed. And principle 2.2, which I've shown you now, indicates that it might well expand over time. So likely candidates here would be a various prescription on terrorist acts, particularly when they are directed to international officials. Now, how does your universal jurisdiction get authorized in practice? And here I'd like to distinguish between universal jurisdiction that's recognized pursuant to a treaty and pursuant to customary international law. Let me give you an example of a treaty first. Here you see Article 5 of the Convention Against Torture, which we've previously studied, and this is the jurisdictional provision. It provides that each state party to this convention 
shall establish its jurisdiction over torture-related offenses in a number of contexts. And you can see that the bases of prescriptive jurisdiction that I referred to earlier are referenced here. There's a reference to crimes committed within the territory of a state party, by a national of a state party, and when the victim was a national of a state party. This corresponds to the territory, nationality, and passive personality principles. In addition, however, you see in paragraph two a requirement for states to establish jurisdiction over torture offenses where the alleged offender is present in any territory under its jurisdiction, and when it doesn't extradite him or turn him over for prosecution to one of the countries listed in the first paragraph. Let's see an example of universal jurisdiction in customary international law. Here I've given you a clause from the Genocide Convention, Article 6, and remember this is one of the very earliest human rights treaties adopted in 1948, and this is its jurisdictional provision. And it says, persons charged with genocide shall be tried by a competent tribunal of the state in the territory of which the act was committed, or by an international penal tribunal that may have jurisdiction. The time gen the Genocide Convention was adopted, there was no international penal tribunal. Today there is the International Criminal Court, as well as certain ad hoc criminal tribunals. And you might wonder about a basis of jurisdiction in the territory of which the act was committed. So a country in which genocide has been carried out might have neither the will nor the means to bring such prosecutions. And as a result, over time, states have taken the view that it would be permissible to have universal jurisdiction over the offense of genocide, notwithstanding any connection to that state's territory. And you can see here a 2007 statute from the United States that applies this principle to individuals found or brought into the United States. Let's turn from these forms of universal jurisdiction to a discussion of the rationales for recognizing universal jurisdiction. I want to run through a number of rationales with you, and then we'll talk about some of the risks that universal jurisdiction poses. So the first rationale might be a rationale with respect to conduct that doesn't affect or only weakly affects any particular state. There might be some activities that would occur outside any state's borders, and thus every state would have an interest in that activity, especially if it causes harm, but they might not have any close connection to regulate or prosecute the, that harmful activity. The example here, the classic and longstanding example, is piracy. And pirates are known by the Latin phrase hostis humanus generis, or enemies of all mankind, and they can, to this day, be subject to prosecution and punishment wherever they are found. And indeed, although piracy prosecutions were quite common in the uh, 18th and 19th century, they dropped off until quite recently with a number of piracy offenses in the coast off of Somalia and also in parts of Southeast Asia. So universal jurisdiction for piracy is alive and well uh, in a number of countries. A second rationale for why we might want universal jurisdiction would be the idea that a state that is prosecuting uh, an offender for a very serious crime under international law is acting as the agent of the international community. That is standing in the shoes of the international community and applying international laws so as to carry out uh, its policies and interests. And the canonical example here was the prosecution in the early 1960s of the high-level Nazi official Adolf Eichmann, who was prosecuted in Israel for crimes against humanity relating to uh, deporting civilians to concentration camps and death camps during World War II. A third rationale for universal jurisdiction is a kind of safety net idea. The, the concept here would be that we wouldn't want perpetrators of serious international crimes to be able to evade accountability 
because they are in a country or only limited to certain countries in which, for whatever reason, they are not subject to a prosecution, and thus they can reside in a safe haven. Universal jurisdiction can close these gaps of accountability by eliminating safe havens. The example here, and a very famous case from 1999, when the UK House of Lords, that country's highest court at the time, concluded that former Chilean President Augusto Pinochet could be extradited to stand trial in Spain for actions relating to alleged torture that occurred during the time that he was in office. Although Pinochet was, for health reasons, not in fact extradited and did return to Chile, he did face criminal charges there that were pending at the time of his death in the 2000s. The Pinochet case is widely seen as the trigger for an expansion of universal jurisdiction. Let me explain why that would be the case. So in the decade following that decision of the UK House of Lords, many states enacted or expanded their universal jurisdiction statutes. These this allowed for the possibility that uh, complainants or prosecutors could bring additional cases when there was no other forum available that had a connection to the crime, the perpetrator, or the victim. Another uh, effect of the Pinochet case was that countries more closely connected to serious human rights violations began to investigate and prosecute the alleged offenders. Now, in response to the increase in universal jurisdiction prosecutions. These were mainly countries in Europe where there were com criminal complaints filed and prosecutions commenced against many alleged human rights violators, including high-level political leaders. The filing of those claims led to what might be seen as a pushback or a kind of backlash by a number of countries whose leaders were named in these cases. And this, I think, brings us to a discussion of some of the risks of universal jurisdiction. And I'd like to talk about those for a few moments before concluding the lecture. So some of the risks I've list listed on this uh, slide, and they basically stem from the idea that there can be friction among nations when one state sits in judgment on the serious crimes of another state's officials. One concern is that universal jurisdiction, even if it's a good idea in principle, would be applied in a politically motivated way. For example, if only certain countries or certain types of countries were uh, subject to universal jurisdiction, or more specifically their officials were subject to universal jurisdiction, that might be viewed as a, a politically motivated act rather than an attempt to hold perpetrators accountable. Another concern is that universal jurisdiction might be applied without sufficient safeguards to pre prevent the abuse of legal processes. So here, uh, if a com complaint could be filed and a proceeding commenced without adequate protection for the rights of the defendants, after all, they have due process rights under international human rights law, or without uh, sufficient guarantees against vexatious or harassing litigation, that too could be not only uh, violative of the rights of the defendant, but also potentially violative of the international law rights of the state and create increasing frictions between governments. Third and finally, when these prosecutions are directed to sitting or former heads of state or high level officials, the possibility for frictions are especially high. And I want to discuss one example of how this problem played itself out in the context of Belgium's universal jurisdiction statute. This was a law that was enacted in 1993 to permit criminal complaints over alleged violations of crimes against humanity and a number of the other crimes listed in an earlier slide. When this statute was applied by the courts and by prosecutors, it led to uh, a flood of complaints being filed against sitting and former heads of state 
and high-level political leaders, including those you see on the slide before you. As you might imagine, these kinds of complaints resulted in a significant negative response by the countries whose leaders had been charged. Now, how could it be possible that these individuals could be subject to this kind of universal jurisdiction, including officials who were still in office? Well, the structure of the universal jurisdiction law in Belgium was such that any private individual could file a criminal complaint which a judge or magistrate had to investigate to determine whether the charges could proceed to trial. And so there was not a sufficient screening mechanism for cases that might violate other principles of international law due to pressure from a number of countries, most notably the United States. The 2003 Belgian law was repealed and amended, and it was scaled back significantly. It was scaled back to limit jurisdiction to cases in which the defendant was a, either a Belgian national or a resident of Belgium, or where the victim was in one of those two categories. In addition, a procedure was created that complaints could be dismissed by a prosecutor if there was a forum that was available with a closer connection to the crime, or if the complaint was groundless. So this has led to a cutting back of universal jurisdiction in Belgium, and indeed it's fair to say that a number of other countries, most notably Spain, and the United Kingdom, which previously had quite broad universal jurisdiction laws, have in the last few years seen them narrowed in response to perceived or claimed excesses with respect to universal jurisdiction. So that leaves us with uh, a few moments to reflect on some of the promises and perils of universal jurisdiction. And I think here I would say a number of things to you to help you think uh, about how to evaluate universal jurisdiction. On the one hand, we want to have, I think, a, a world in which there are no accountability gaps. That is to say, in which safe havens for individuals who have committed heinous wrongs, contrary to international law, can be prosecuted. On the other hand, a national court may not be the best place for such a prosecution, particularly the national court of a country that has no connection to the offense. Now, to the extent that there can be criminal prosecutions at the international level, and if that international prosecution system is working well, we might not have as much of a need for universal jurisdiction. I don't think we can say that currently, today, that that international system exists because not all members of the United Nations have ratified the International Criminal Court Statute, for example, and not all members of the United Nations would prosecute individuals who are high-level perpetrators of genocide, crimes against humanity, torture, and so forth in their national legal systems. So those are arguments in favor of continuing universal jurisdiction. Arguments against doing so would be that trying uh, a case against a defendant in a court with no connection to the offense, the offender, or the victims is going to be challenging in terms of evidentiary proof. It's going to be challenging in terms of being time consuming, in terms of being able to uh, elicit cooperation from officials in the country where the crime occurred. And so I would argue that universal jurisdiction should, at least for the time being, remain, but only if a state with another basis for exercising criminal jurisdiction is not able to investigate and prosecute. I think it's also worth noting that currently sitting officials who are carrying out the business of their governments do need to be able to continue to uh, carry out their uh, duties without regard to what might be uh, frivolous litigation in another domestic court in another country. After they step down from office, I think the issues are more complicated. I'll conclude the lecture by giving you some uh, additional sources where you can find out more about the promises and perils of universal jurisdiction.